Today we visit a special place where gardening and wildlife care are woven together into a beautiful tapestry. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs. Our goal is to leave you free to just enjoy your garden. Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs can be found at local garden centers across the country. Power Planters Garden Drill Augers are designed to help you tackle the digging jobs in your garden or yard. Dig through hard soil to assist in planting trees, shrubs, and annuals. Power Planters Heavy Duty Augers, made for professional landscapers and home gardeners alike. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Jaguar F-Pace. Carolina Avian Research and Education, located in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina, gives sanctuary to rare and endangered birds from around the world who have special needs. These birds are lovingly cared for and studied, and the resulting knowledge is shared with other avian facilities. Owner Leanne Searhouse is dedicated to providing the best environment for the many species of birds that find a home at CARE. Leanne is also an internationally recognized plant hybridizer who holds patents on several plants and continues to create superior varieties of water lilies, irises, daylilies, and canna lilies. Leanne is also a seasoned lecturer who's been on the speaking circuit for over 25 years. CARE's work with these very special birds is funded through plant sales and speaking engagements. CARE is also open to the public and Leanne would love to have you stop by if you're in the area and support her work. Today we meet with Leanne to discuss the exciting intersection of gardening and wildlife. Leanne, thanks so much for joining us. What a fascinating place you've built in a few short years. Eric, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Well, you've got a very, a very interesting and exciting story that, that brought you uh, from your early days as a child to getting interested in plants to where you are today. And I'd love for our viewers to hear it. Fantastic. Well, my adventure with plant began with my childhood. I was born and raised in South Florida, and we had plenty of swamps in South Florida for me to play in. <laughs> and your parents let you play in the swamps? It doesn't sound safe. They didn't know in the beginning. <laughs> when, she, when my mother found out later, she was horrified. And so when, when you were finding plants in the swamp, these are just like the native aquatic plants, right? They were. They were our, our natives that I fell in love with first, and later on when I opened up an aquatic nursery, I realized that people, people wanted some diversity. They didn't want right. to come and just buy the native white water lily. So I realized that I could cross-breed them and come right. up with new varieties to sell to people. Wow, so what were some of the more interesting ones that was part of your early breeding work? Well, Osceola. Okay. Um, named after the Indian chief, of course. And that was a cross between Mexicana and Odorata. Yeah, and so through all of that, you know, you, you of course, you've been a, a gardener your, your whole life. Um, and that's, that's led you to where you are here today. And you've got this beautiful bird sanctuary. And, and I think a, a really keen and deep appreciation for the, the role that, that nature plays in the garden inviting wildlife into the garden. And, and I think that's a, a wonderful part of your story. I couldn't have a life without nature in it. Right. And I gotta have flowers. Absolutely. Well, I know you've got some, some beautiful lilies uh, for us to look at. Let's go take a look at your nursery. Fantastic. Well, 
Leanne, I've always been fascinated by aquatic plants, and I think part of that is just, it's, it's such an indelible part of our experience of being out in nature. And, and for me as a gardener, I feel like a water feature is just an obligatory, necessary part of any garden. And then if you have a water feature, you have to have plants in it. I agree, Eric. I, I just don't see how you can have a garden without some form of water, even if it's a bird bath. Right. But if you have a, a, a water garden, even the better. Absolutely. So you've got this beautiful nursery that you've built and there's such an incredible array of diversity. Would you talk us through some of the plants that you have here and, and uh, especially some of the ones that are really unique and, and special to you? It's a small nursery. It's a boutique nursery. Sure. And I've got a lot of different kinds of marginals. Those are shallow water plants. They're going to go in the area of the pond that is going to have anywhere from two to three inches over the top of the pot. Some of the ones I grow are native and some of them are not. Sure. Some of them flower and some of them have beautiful foliage. And then I have the magnificent water lilies and they come in all colors and shapes and sizes. I grow hardy and tropical, day blooming and night blooming. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the water lilies specifically. When, when someone buys them from your nursery and transports them to their garden, how do you recommend those being used or, or planted? What's the best way to ensure their success? Great question. So if you buy a water lily from me, it's going to be pre-potted okay. and ready for you to just take home and set in your pond. No worry about potting it up because they can be a little difficult and intimidating for people that haven't done it before. Do you recommend leaving them in the in the container once they're they're installed in the water garden, or are there ever reasons to to actually plant them in the pond? Yeah, I recommend keeping them in the pot okay. because most aquatic plants sooner or later are going to become a little bit rambunctious, shall yes. we say, <laughs> and they may need a little um, bring it back moment. They, yeah, they need a little discipline. Yeah, so that uh, <laughs> once a year or once every two years, you're going to want to take them out and cut them back and repot them and put them back in. Yeah. So is there any other care and maintenance that we need to, to bear in mind um, for our water lilies? So most of your aquatic plants want a good amount of sun. And I know a lot of people feel like they want their pond to be in the shade because they're worried about algae. Truly, if you have your water garden planted with the right kind and the right amount of plants, you really won't have an algae problem. With that being said, algae is a part of the environment and it shouldn't be feared if you have a little bit of algae in your pond. Right, right. So Leanne, I, I know you've got some wonderful examples to show us, but if, if I only have a small deck or a little patio, you can still grow aquatic plants. Absolutely. There are uh, some pond plants that are semi-dwarf and some that are actually dwarf. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's go look at the couple of examples you put together for us. I'd love to. Leanne, I, I love how in, in the last few decades, gardeners and, and especially plant breeders have been making selections that really work well for small spaces. And I think part of that is just that so many people in America all only have like a little patio or a small deck but they all want a garden. And so what do you do? In this case, water gardening, it, it may seem like that's completely unapproachable if all you have is a very small space. It's not true though. There's, there's amazing things that you can do in just a very small container. There are. Eric, I love having a tub garden. This is full of aquatic life and joy. It brings a place for the birds to come and take a sip of water. Beauty for you to look at every day. You can even put a goldfish in there if you want to. You don't have to feed them because their job is to eat the mosquito larvae and the algae. Right. So talk to me about how we put this together. So I'm going I'm to go to my garden center. I'm going to come visit you Great. and buy the supplies I need. How do, how do we build this? So yeah, you want to start with a container that is a minimum of 20 inches in diameter. Bigger is better in this case. It's important that it not have any holes in the bottom. Okay, of course. Most of the big box stores sell plenty of containers now that do not have holes in the bottom, so they lend themselves easily to water gardening. 
So you want to start with some basics that you do even in regular pots. So you want to have some height in the background, something in the midground, and something in the foreground, maybe even flowing out. So what are, what are some good plant suggestions? If, if we're just getting started, we're going we're gonna to make our first aquatic bowl. Um, what would you recommend? What would are particularly good for this kind of aquaculture? Well, for this particular tub garden, I chose a dwarf cypress okay. or umbrella palm, mm -hmm. and it is in the background, and it's been um, placed in the same pot as a taro, which is what they make poi out of. Right, yeah, right. So this is an imperial taro, and they look lovely together, and they, they really give do. some dimension to the pot. The next thing I did was I put in the smallest water lily in the world. The name of it is Helvola, and it is a very, very old variety, several hundred years old. Really? It comes from Germany, yes. And then I wanted to put in a floater. This is water hyacinth. I love that plant. And it has roots that hang down and filter the water. Excellent. It also blooms during the summer. And then the, one of the most important things that you're going to want to add to your tub garden is some kind of a piece of wood. It not only looks terrific, but it's there to save the life of a bird that might accidentally fall in when it's taking a sip of water. So any kind of piece of wood that will fit in there nicely and give the little bird something to grab onto so that it can safely get out of the tub garden. So are there, are there any considerations with regards to you know, anything else that's in the bowl or the water that we use? Do you recommend only using rainwater or is, is tap water fine? Tap water is fine as long as you let it age for two or three days before you put plants or fish in there. And if you don't want to put fish in there and you're worried about having mosquitoes, then there's a product called Bacillus thuringiensis right, right. that will actually kill the larva, but it's safe to birds and pets if they drink out of it. Absolutely. So, Leah, let's talk a little bit about, about some of the, the, the tropicals and other plants that people can use in these bowls. I see you've got a beautiful lotus. Uh, there's a bunch of different really, really interesting plants um, that would be nice companions. People are fascinated by lotus. They have been for as long as I've been around. And if you want to do a tub garden featuring a lotus, I highly recommend that you plant the lotus down in the bottom of the pot instead of keeping it in separate pots. The lotus that you see over behind you is in a tub and it is the pot. And, and do, you use, do you use like soil for the, for the base there? Is there a particular media that you so like? So I do. I have a formula for that. I want to start in the very bottom with about four inches of good heavy topsoil. Okay. You're going to put in about two inches of white or yellow sand on top of that. You want to wet it, and then you want to take your lotus tuber and push it down through the white sand and put a small stone on top of it to hold it in place. Gotcha. You then want to very slowly raise the water level to just over the top of the tuber, and then as the lotus grows, we're going to raise every week the water level until you get to the top. And, and once, once our, our planner's done, is it kind of set it and forget it? It really is. The only thing is if you're living in zone six or colder, okay. you're going to need to bring that tub in for the winter because it's so small that it can actually freeze all the way through. Oh, of course. Of course. And even though your pond plants that we're talking about now are winter hardy, they won't survive being in a block of ice. As is true of most passionate gardeners, your interest in plants goes way beyond aquatics. And you've done some great work in many, many other categories. And I want you to tell us about some of those. We've got this beautiful can of here. This is one of yours. This is one of mine. This is one of my early on hybrids. And I was warned early on, keep it short. So they said, you know, the world is a change in. You need your breeding program to have smaller and smaller plants. So this is a mid-height canna. This is Canna Marmalade Skies. 
and it's gonna max out at about four feet. We see the world of breeding going in that direction. It has been for some time. It's not even a trend. It's just kind of the way it is now that, you know, as people have smaller and smaller lots and, and homes, they still want to be able to enjoy a canna, but can't really accommodate one of those giant ones that our grandmothers used to have. Right. The other thing that we need to do when we're in the breeding process of the cannas is to keep them more confined. Right. So some cannas, for instance, there's one that I named Hussy, and she is a Hussy. <laughs> she runs all over the garden. You never know where she's going to end up. There you go. But then we have Blushing Bride that stays very much in a nice, round, compact circle. And Marmalade Skies has a lot of brown built into the, into the flower. Okay. And it helps with the fading because it's out in the full sun. Gotcha. It's also self-cleaning. Wonderful, and that's a great feature. You know, with, with certain plants that, that hold onto the petals just a little too long, not the best garden feature. And so if they come self-cleaning, only a bonus. Let's talk about daylilies a little bit. You've got a plant that you're really passionate about and you've done some work in that space as well. I am passionate about them but I'm passionate most about good daylilies, right. good disease resistance, and good rebloom. That's so important. I also like branching. I'm obsessed with daylilies that have branches coming off of the main stalk. Right, right. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great feature. You just get so much more flower power. Um, and also structurally, I think in the garden, it's just a better look. So as a plant breeder, there, there's got to be so many other things you've got in your back pocket and other plants that you've worked on over the years. Are you going to tell us about them? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't even know where to start. The, I, I've never dabbled with food, food crops. Okay. I'm strictly ornamental in aquaculture and landscape plants. And I've done some, some annuals, but mostly I want to be into the perennials. People love perennials. Right. And, they want the big, they want the big investment, you know, right. to, to pay off. And having perennials, they last for years. Right, right. Well, I'm so excited to see what you come up with in the years to come and, and really, really appreciate all the passion that you put behind these great plants that you've um, basically gifted to the industry. So it's great to see. I think the natural beauty of a prairie is it's almost impossible to beat. Um, and especially if you have the room to accommodate it in your garden, it's great for pollinators and just the way that it brings all the, the birds and butterflies, all the nature right, right next door. It's fantastic, Eric. I've, I've put in about a year of work on this so far and it's next year it's really gonna come into its own. Right here, we've got a bog salvia. This is a native plant. And we've got some hoary vervain over there. We've got some sunflowers. We've got some Rebecca or black-eyed Susan. Right now, those are the dominant plants. And um, through, the, through the season, which begins in late winter, we have about a two week window where everything kind of changes in the wildflower meadow. And it's just remarkable to watch it go through the different phases. Many gardeners will get into their garden, they prune back all of those finished seed heads. We don't want to do that in the meadow, right? Correct. So what we see over here is we have a lot of Rebecca's that have finished blooming and they are finishing the formation of those seeds that are inside the seed heads. This is a crucial time for a wildflower garden because those seeds are what's going to feed wildlife through the winter and keep them around on your property. And as the birds get in there and they eat away at the seeds, they, they always kick a few off that, you know, that starts new plants. And it's just a wonderful way of keeping the prairie happy and healthy. And that's the way that it would exist in the wild is, you know, these seeds get spread out and the things that are the most successful you know, end up dominating the prairie, but, but you, you always end up with a great diversity if you let it go to seed, provide the food for the wildlife, and just, you know, kind of see what happens. It will evolve with your space. For the most part, um, you know, once it's established, it's pretty self-sustaining. Yeah, so we do go through um, 
Every week or so when we spot out for some invasive species that have snuck in and we pull them out, get rid of them, and like you said, it's pretty low maintenance. After the birds have ravaged the uh, seed heads, I'll come through with mowers and just mow it down to the ground and then we'll begin life over again in the spring. So you are perhaps as passionate about birds as you are about anything in life. Yes, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, tell us about the uh, the wonderful work that you're doing, that you're doing with birds, right alongside everything that's happening in your garden. Eric, this is Jack, also known as Handsome Jack. Hey, Jack, Jack is a Harris's hawk. They come from the American Southwest Desert, and they're the only bird of prey that hunt in a pack. Fascinating. Yeah, so Jack comes to us from a breeding facility in Oregon. And he had an accident there and he lost an eye and they thought that he would be better off somewhere else. Right. So I specialize here in accepting birds that have limitations. Sure. Um, as long as they can live a happy life and be free of pain, they're usually going to be welcome here. Right. So I am a master falconer. That's the class that the government assigned to Wonderful. me. And I do hunt with Jack. So we go out in the fall and winter and we hunt. And Jack likes to get rabbits and squirrels. And because we don't have a pack here for him, I am his pack member. <laughs> That's awesome. So what are some of the other, other, other birds that you have in your flock? Oh my goodness. Well, we have a waterfowl exhibit. Okay. And we have um, ducks from all over the world in there. And we have many, many birds from many different countries. In fact, we have birds from every continent in the world. Really? Except Antarctica. Okay. Yeah. So penguins soon? No, I don't keep fish eaters. They're too stinky. <laughs> <laughs> we've heard your, your roaming geese talking to us as we've been out in, in yes, the garden. They're the so much fun. Roaming geese, yes. You know, they have quite the history. They're the oldest breed known to mankind. Really? It is said that they were brought to the people of Rome as a gift by the goddess Juno herself. Really? Yes, and they were in fact housed in Juno's sacred temple. Really? Now, Roman soldiers were party boys. One night they drank way too much wine and they were passed out drunk all over the city of Rome. In came some invading armies and they were gonna take over Rome and the Roman soldiers didn't even wake up. But the geese, the Roman geese heard them and they ran to the Roman soldiers and woke them up and they're credited with saving Rome. Well, what a fun day. There's so much to see here and, and I feel like we've learned so much about plants and, and in a gardening show, we it, it's not often that we get to learn a lot about birds too. So an amazing marriage of two passions what a great day, Leanne. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for coming, Eric. Oh, of course. Each week, we travel the country north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs. Our goal is to leave you free to just enjoy your garden. Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs can be found at local garden centers across the country. Power Planters Garden Drill Augers are designed to help you tackle the digging jobs in your garden or yard. Dig through hard soil to assist in planting trees, shrubs, and annuals. Power Planters Heavy Duty Augers, made for professional landscapers and home gardeners alike. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Jaguar F-Pace. 
It's not often that we get an inside look into the world of rare birds from the vantage point of a renowned plant breeder. What a special treat. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we garden smart.